Cynthia's third talk on driven colloids and jamming. She doesn't need any more introduction, so just Cynthia, please go ahead. Okay, thank you very much, and also thanks to the organizers who have really been enjoying the school. So on this third and final lecture, the first lecture I gave you, I was talking to you about a system that we understand quite well, which is graphics. And in the last lecture, I talked to you about a system that we are maybe starting to get some understanding. So in this talk, I'll basically be telling you about a system that we really don't understand. But hopefully you can still learn some things uh, about what's interesting about this system and what we, have, what we know and what we hope we might be able to learn in the future. Okay, so here's an outline of today's talk. Uh, first I'll introduce granular media and the jamming phase diagram. And you've actually already heard about jamming from, at least from Steve Title and maybe yeah. from another lecture. So hopefully you remember that, but just in case you don't, I'll give you a brief refresher and uh, remind you about uh, what's called point J in the context of this jamming phase diagram that's been introduced. Whether it's a phase transition and whether this whole granular system has anything to do with galaxy systems or not. Uh, then I'll describe how we're approaching this system, which is once again particle-based simulation of, of uh, particles in 2D. In this case, it's a disordered two-dimensional packing of disks. Uh, we see a couple of different results, including evidence of a diverging length scale, uh, which we find by dragging one particle through the packing. Um, velocity fluctuations which change character significantly as you approach jamming. And I'll actually give you a brief introduction to how you can do a multi-scaling analysis and what that even means in this context. And finally, at the end, I'll talk a little bit about what happens if you add quench disorder to the system, which is an unusual thing to add to a granular system, but still interesting. Uh, we call it a fourth axis of the jamming phase transition. It actually changes things quite a bit. My last slide, I didn't commit anything to writing, but I'll talk to you a little bit about what we think right now about a clogging transition instead of a jamming transition. So of course, jamming is very familiar in essentially non-Newtonian fluids. Uh, I'm from the Midwest, so the most common example is lots of agricultural products. Uh, there's granular media. If you have grains in a silo that are being loaded into a a train to be carried over to places where people need to eat. Uh, they'll get stuck, and you'll see on the hoppers a big dents from where they take a sledgehammer and <laughs> until it starts flowing again, you know, it's kind of low tech. Um, of course, you can have the more high tech uh, granular media. I'm sure they don't use sledgehammers if, they're, if uh, pharmaceutical companies are processing pills and, and those get stuck. And then uh, something we fortunately don't experience too much in those almost where there's like three people is uh, <laughs> the case of traffic jamming. And you're probably all far too familiar with this phenomenon where you increase the density of cars and at some point you go through a transition when you just nothing moves anymore. Okay, so the, a technical definition of jamming is simply the development of a resistance to shear. So of course granular media is a kind of unusual media. It has um, it'll resist a tensile force, but it doesn't have, I mean, excuse me, it'll resist a compressive force, but it doesn't have any resistance to a tensile force. So that means if you're going to develop this resistance to shear, somehow you have to make it such that the system will respond compressively under all conditions. Now, granular media will jam, but stuff like the superconducting vortices that I show you usually will not, although we've been able to come up with some really special cases where we can get them to jam. And so what is special about grains compared to the systems I've been showing you up to this point? Well, the big difference is the interaction. <coughs> uh, the superconducting vortices and the charge collets that I was showing you in my other lectures have sort of a medium to long range interaction. So if I have one vortex or colloid over here and I have another particle approaching it, well before they reach each other's position, they know that they're coming into contact and so they can start to get out of the way early. And so by the time they've reached, by the time this guy gets to where this guy was, this guy's already out of the way. Granular media has a very short range interaction. So uh, that means the particles don't know they're going to interact until it's already too late. So this guy, this, you can think of blindfolding your particles or something. So this grain, and you have another grain coming up, and this one won't get out of the way because it doesn't know until this one hits it that it's going to interact. And so then you can get situations where you'll get uh, jamming because things just weren't able to get out of the way. Now, back how it's been 10 years now, uh, that Andrea Liu and Sid Nagel proposed a jamming phase diagram. And Steve Title should have shown you this, and possibly, this is the old, the classic phase diagram. There's a newer version where these lines are a little different shape, but I'll just, I'll stick with the 1998 version, because I kind of like it. But it's 
essentially, uh, Lou and Nagel made the claim that uh, you have a, a, a jammed dome uh, on a phase diagram where you have this axis, this temperature, this axis is low, so if you just shear the system, for instance. And this axis is the inverse density. So if you lower the temperature, shear your system less, or just increase the density of your system, you enter a jam state and everything freezes up and uh, won't move anymore. Now what was interesting about this is they made the claim that, well, if you go along the temperature axis here, uh, you have a liquid state when you're not jammed, but maybe you actually have glass state when you're jammed. And so their claim is that uh, the glassy state is actually a distinct state from a liquid. A glass isn't just a really, really viscous liquid, which it could be, but that the glass is actually something different, and that there's a true phase transition when you enter the glassy state. Uh, this is, of course, highly controversial. There's lots of fights in the, the glass community. One of the problems with this line between the liquid and glass transition is that because it's at finite temperature, it's really hard to make measurements uh, without worrying about long time relaxation effects. So, you know, perhaps you tried to measure something, but maybe if you waited 10 times longer, the measurement would actually be different. Because this, this is a system, glasses tend to relax very slowly. So it's difficult to know whether you've made a true measurement along this line. Now, Lou and Nato pointed out that there's a special spot on this jamming phase diagram, which they call point J, that falls here at zero temperature on the inverse density axis. And they call this point J because at this point, you can have a jamming transition without any thermal fluctuations at all. So that means you don't have to worry about relaxation effects. You can just go measure this point, learn something about whether this looks like a transition or not, what the nature of that transition is. And then it's a bit of a leap of faith to say, well, is that, are the properties of this point continue along this line? You have to worry a little because zero T can't be a special case. But if it's not, uh, you know, maybe you could actually learn something about this line. So that was what got people very excited about this uh, jamming phase diagram. I don't know how many times this paper has been cited, but it's a lot. And uh, so there's, this is a very active field. So this is, I, I, since my topic is college, I've got one slide that actually has college in it. So here is the, uh, the slide that, where I uh, introduce the jamming gas transition to people that work only on correlated electrons because then you can say that Phil Anderson himself said that glass to glass transition is the deepest and most interesting unsolved problem in solid state theory. And he probably, well, I think at this point he believes he had solved high TC. Um, so I think that uh, back to thinking that high TC is the most important. Um, at any rate, so this is an image from Eric Wink's lab uh, where he, well, I think it was, this is actually Dave Wake's lab when Eric was working in it. Uh, this is an image of colloid positions when the colloidal system is entering a glassy state. And they changed into the glassy state uh, by increasing the density of the colloidal system. This is a control for microscopy picture, so they're getting a nice 3D image of the colloid positions. And what they did in this case is they highlighted colloids that moved more than some threshold distance, which they set uh, according to some arbitrary way. But they said as well, if we're kind of away from this glassy state, we tend to see lots of little individual colloids wiggling around in the system. But as you start to get close to the glass transition, now you start to see kind of these correlated patches of colloids moving around. So this is this uh, sort of dynamic heterogeneity that's associated with glass systems. Okay, so again, as I said, the glass transition occurs at finite temperature where you have to worry a lot about relaxation effects. Point J is not thermal, but it is well defined. So let's take a look at point J. Uh, our work, so what got us interested in this was uh, work that Lou and Nagel did with Corey O'Hearn as a first author, which was they started uh, doing some simulations of granular systems and trying to see if they could extract any kind of diverging length scale at the jamming transition. So like, if it is a phase transition, you would expect some kind of divergence. So what they did is set up a uh, series of simulations with increasing numbers of grains. So they first just took 18 grains and started them uh, at very low density, essentially, and just kept shrinking their box and doing uh, steepest descent, I believe, until the, the grains would touch and they couldn't make the box any smaller. And then they asked, well, what is the density inside our box? And they did that over and over and over again. And what they found was the, the jam density, they looked at the distribution of that. So if you only have 18 grains, there's a really wide spread of densities at which the system jams because, of course, it's a statistics of small numbers here. 
But as you increase the number of grains that you put in your box, this uh, sharpens up significantly and starts to center around basically 0.84. And so by looking at the way that these distributions diverge, uh, they, they hypothesize that yes, it does look like there's some length scale L, and uh, it looks like it's diverging with an exponent negative 1 over nu, uh, and they measured their nu to be 0.71, and they said, well, we can relate that to a length scale, which should be diverging as we approach the, uh, the damping transition, phi c being the damping density, phi c minus 5 to the exponent nu. So here's, here's their exponent measurement. And they gave the interpretation in the paper that, well, what would this mean? If you pushed on one grain, then you would expect a perturbation among the other grains, which should occur <coughs> in the length scale of this side, uh, of this C. So we liked this picture, and uh, we decided to do an experiment. Even though I'm a theorist, this is my one experiment. Because uh, this one I can do. This experiment costs about $3. Uh, which is, uh, is, this is actually not my experiment, but I found these other ones. Uh, the cost of kind of a rough scale of area? Uh, well, no, not use pennies and nickels. I mean, and, and try to use four points that are worth nothing anyway. Uh, but, uh, yeah, we, well, there's also a sociology experiment, because we left this experiment out and all the quarters disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> The only thing is they can't all be the same. Because if you take only pennies, you're going to get a triangle or less. So it's not what you want. So you have to have at least two species in points. And uh, well, if you arrange them on the table at fairly low density, you just grab one point. You ask yourself, well, what if I want to move this coin across the table? How many other coins do I get? So if it's at low density, basically you hardly get anything. You'll, you'll bash into this guy, these guys, but essentially it's a, it's a pretty moving system. But now you increase the density, and when you're at high density, you'll find but if you try to move one of the coins, practically all the other coins will also move all the other coins in kind of a forward opening angle. Uh, until you hit the experimental problem of one coin jumping on top of another. But, you know, uh, it's, it's not a truly confined to the system in this case. At any rate, and you can actually see force changes. It's really quite interesting. So this, this gave us the idea, like, well, maybe you could really measure a length scale uh, just the way that they sketched it in their paper, actually do a simulation and really measure a length scale and see how it looks when you do it when, you, when you're not doing it coarsely like this on a table, but really do it carefully. So we got a very talented undergraduate student to help us out, and we set up a two-dimensional granular dynamics simulation. Uh, we decided we wanted to actually model coins on a table, so we decided to treat our brains as disks, which have over and dynamics. And the idea is that if you really do this on the table, it's pretty frictional. So uh, we didn't want any mass to come into play. We didn't want to play caroms. So we wanted things to be fairly uh, slow and smooth. Um, as I said, you can't do this with just one species of disk. So we set up a binary mixture of disks. And we copied over and all by taking our radius ratio to be 1.4 to 1. Um, so these are the two sizes of disks. And basically, everybody's, everybody that's worked on this problem is using this same aspect ratio, just for consistency. Uh, we took a system, uh, we, we looked at two different system lengths, 24 uh, on a side and 60 on a side, and so for our, our main system, that means we have uh, 2,600 disks in the sample, one where a density close to the jamming density, which in our original work was around 0.839. Now, initialization turns out to be actually really a problem. Uh, if, if you think about how you make a dense packing of disks physically, um, you can you can put them down randomly while there's still free space, but you won't put them down quite right, so you'll still have free space left, but none of it is in, there's not enough room for a new grain to fit where the space is. So what you probably do is you kind of shape them around a little bit and then add more grains. So that's what we do in our initialization. I think we more or less reinvented the torquato stillinger algorithm for making a dense random packet. So it's not an easy problem. Um, and I won't go into more detail, but if you're interested in making dense random packings, I can talk to you about it. And then we decided to make a very simple interaction of the grains, which is once again over damp dynamics. And we just took the simplest thing we could, which was we said that the grains, when they interact with each other, first of all, they don't know about each other until they're within, in a, within each other's radii. And when, once they get close enough together, then they interact with an extremely stiff spring. Now, of course, you'd really want to have the grains have a hard wall interaction, and that's what they are physically. But you can't do hard walls in molecular dynamics type simulations because that's an infinite force. So we just made a really stiff force. 
And as long as we're working below the downing density, our choice, our specific choice of interaction potential shouldn't matter because they're not really interacting very much. Once you go above the downing potential, then I'm sure the form of the potential affects your results. And, all, and the Chicago group has worked in that regime. Uh, let's see. And then finally, we take one of the grains, just one, and write it through the system. Some fixed distance. We used one fifth of the distance in the original uh, simulations we were doing. And try to measure how many other grains did that grain push. This is a well defined uh, quantity in our simulation because since the interaction range has a very sharp cutoff, either they're touching or they're not. So it's just a binary decision. And we can simply go identify all the grains that are in a force contact with the driven grain. So we get an image of uh, what the system looks like as we increase the density. How many other grains did our driven grain push out of this way on the way across? So here's the driven grain. We, we drove it along the 45 degree angle in the original work. And uh, we started it here and drove it one fifth of the system size. And this is for density 0.656. So this is actually the system is really quite boring for densities below 0.6. Hardly anything happens. So this is where something weird starts to happen. And essentially, you can see, first of all, that as the grain has moved through, it's leaving an empty space. Because these are grains, so there's no reason for them to come back in and fill in. There's no pressure or anything. Um, so it just makes snow fog its way through. And then these red grains are currently in force contact with the moving grains. So you can see it's kind of pushed them around. It's not necessarily a, uh, it's not necessarily driving these, but this one is touching one that is being pushed by the moving grains. So you can measure that. Uh, here is a higher density, now this is 0.811, and I should point out we have periodic boundaries here. So this piece belongs here, this piece belongs here. So as, as we go to higher density, you see that we start to push kind of a circular area out of the way. And uh, finally, when we hit the jam state, uh, which of course is going to be limited by the finite size of our system, now our, uh, when we push one grade, it no longer leaves a path behind because we're actually pushing all the grades. So everything is just very slowly moving. We have a few rattlers in here that are blue. They're just loose at the moment, but they'll get picked back up again. So you're pushing the entire system into jam state. So what we can do, uh, let me show you a movie of what this looks like. So uh, here are our grains. The previous image, you couldn't tell the difference in size, but here are the grains at actual size. And here we're pushing this way because it's a uh, newer simulation. But uh, here's the driven grain. And once again, grains, grains that are in force contact with it are going to be lit in red. And this is at a relatively low density of 0.67. So here you can see the grain moving through the packing. And at this density, it has a fairly easy time getting through. It deviates a little bit out of the way. We're doing fixed force here. And we're not constraining the grain to uh, not move along Y. And then uh, you can see they're sort of flashing on and on. What's happening is that we have very tenuous contacts. Uh, that just barely touch and just barely don't touch. That happens only at these lower densities. At the higher densities, the system goes away. But you can see we can sort of define an average length scale here, kind of this part, uh, for, this, for this case. Now if we go closer to jamming, uh, you'll see once again we can define kind of an average length scale, but it's longer. So here's the grain pushing through. This is at 0.801. And now you see, yeah, there's kind of, it's, the, the disturbance is staying roughly this far ahead of the grain that's being pushed through. And of course, these grains have to be pushed around the front of the grain a little bit and circulate back. Um, so this is really the length scale that we're extracting in this case. But the disturbance somehow doesn't disappear after the grain is passed, right? Yeah, that's because it's compressed the packing and now they're touching behind it. Mm -hmm. So like I said, there's no, there's no spring force that puts it back to the original state um, after this has gone through. So this is actually denser than it was before we started pushing the grain. Other? Yes? Uh, does it matter how fast you push it? Um, for for this limit? case, no, not significantly. Because as I said, it's over to him. I mean, if we push it too fast, we start to break our interaction. And it'll, you know, we'll, we'll push them too close together. But basically, for what I'm showing you here, speed is not an, an issue. There was another. Well, 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 why don't the grains come and occupy the path? Then? Ah, well, there's no, they're grains. I mean, if you do this with coins on a table, you know, they're just, they're just going to sit there because yeah. there's, there isn't any. Once they're touching, they don't, they don't mind touching, okay. right? So there's nothing that will push them away. If this was a charge system, it would be completely different. We have actually done this for uh, charged colloids, and then you get a circulation. And I can, if you want, I have a movie of that I can show you. It's, it's really quite different behavior. So that's why I said the short range nature of the granular interaction really changes the way it behaves. 
Okay, and finally, this is a system that actually jams, but it moves first. And so what you'll see here, here the driven particle is actually just right at the end of the periodic boundary, so it'll come right around. You'll see the disturbance propagate really quite quickly through the system. So here it goes. Um, and it very quickly has perturbed the whole system. So at this point, we're basically, yeah, it, here it's touching. So now we're hitting the finite size of our system. We can't, if the leg scale grows any more than that, we're not going to be able to see it unless we do a larger system. And the other thing you'll notice, okay, so now the brain is no longer leaving a path, but it's actually still managing to make its way through. And it's having to kind of rearrange the grains in front of it so that they circulate. Now they actually are coming around and going in, but in this case, it's because they're being pushed out of the way by the driven particle. Uh, and this, at this point, it actually it can't get through anymore. It's no longer able to make that rearrangement. That's it. So it's stuck up to this point. So this is what we would call a jam state in our system. So now what we do is we count how many red grains there were. Uh, is question? So you don't independently test for jamming? What do you mean independently? Well, so I mean something else to verify oh, okay. the so yeah, we kind of tried what Ohern did, initialized their system that way. Uh, we didn't try that. Our jamming density is in good agreement with other people's jamming density for the same system. So we think it's pretty reasonable. But when but you yeah, say a system's jammed, it's just because this thing scales by the yeah, essentially this link scale has become larger than our system in this case. Okay, so let's see. So we look as a function of density. How many other grains are we pushing? And we see that this diverges actually quite rapidly as we approach the damning density. So we measured to be 0.839 in this set of simulations. So now we can replot this on a log log plot. So here's the number moving. And here's uh, the critical jamming density minus 5. And you see we get a nice scaling here, we can extract an exponent. So we say the number moving is 5 to minus 5 to the exponent tau. And within our accuracy, we said, well, tau is between 1.2 and 1.46. And it wasn't the greatest accuracy. Uh, now what we really want, though, is we don't want this exponent tau. Uh, we want, which is the exponent associated with this length scale. Um, the same exponent that over it all had measured. And so we can make an argument. Well, uh, the, the, uh, this exponent tau is just going to be this exponent nu times the dimensionality of the packing that we are moving out of the way. Which, when we originally started, we thought couldn't be packed, but we thought we would get a bunch of force chains. But as you saw, it was actually pretty much around pancake. So if we take d equals 2, just a two-dimensional object, then we extract uh, an exponent nu between 0.6 and 0.7. Uh, so questions? I was going to ask about kind of the other way of doing the motions. You did constant force. So you can uh -huh. also imagine moving it, say, at a constant velocity yes. and looking at, say, force fluctuations. Yes. And of course, you put an infinity a jamming or something. Yes. yes. And you, did you do that? We have not done that. We are actually doing the new series of simulations now where we're doing things like constraining it to be unable to move in the y direction because there was an experiment that was attempted at now and looks like isn't quite working out where that's what they were doing. And uh, so we're making that comparison. But yeah, you, you can do constant force. In fact, the experiment actually was doing constant force, uh, with, excuse me, constant velocity, and looking at force fluctuations. So our idea was to compare with them. But we don't have any data from them. So we haven't finished that. Um, was there another? OK. So yes, yeah, so now we've measured an exponent move between 0.6 and 0.7. So this was a slide that I had uh, until fairly recently where we were taking a look at, well, maybe there's some evidence that there is some kind of non-equilibrium phase transition. And the reason is that everybody is getting sort of consistent, or was, getting kind of consistent measurements of this exponent nu. So the original measurement by O'Quarren all, where they were coming in along the density axis, they found nu to be 0.71. Our measurement, where we looked at the length scale directly, we also found nu to be between 0.6 and 0.7, and that's along this axis. And then there was more recent work by uh, Steve Tidal's group, where they came in along the load axis, and you may have probably talked to you about this. And they found an exponent in 2007 of 0.6 plus minus 0.1. So we thought, wow, well, this is nice. Uh, it means that maybe jamming is a second order phase transition in the directed percolation class, because let me remind you from yesterday, uh, the space like directed percolation exponent is 0.73. So they like, thought, well, that's kind of ballpark. But there's a problem. Actually, there's more than one problem. One, the first problem is that uh, Steve proceeded to make even more accurate measurements of this exponent, and it went up. Now, you know, he had 0.6, so if it went up to 0.7, that would probably be okay. But it's actually gone up to 0.84, 
is my understanding. So this is too big. Uh, the exponent is not staying where it should be to stay within the, this directed percolation regime. Uh, there's another problem which I'll get to a little bit later in the talk. We are starting to think there may not be one length scale. We think there may actually be more than one length scale in this problem, and they're being dumped together. And so this kind of needs to be disentangled. So I think something more complicated than directed percolation is going on, which may or may not be a second order phase transition. And so since we're not longer so sure the jamming is really a phase transition, we don't know if we can say anything about the glass transition, which of course you don't know whether finite temperature will change in everything. Else. Okay, so that was sort of a used to be a result, and it's not. So what else do we learn? So far, in our original analysis, we were just trying to look at length scales, but we were actually throwing away a lot of the information that we got from our local probe measurement, which is uh, the local probe told us velocity information. When we had a time series, as we pushed the probe through the packing, we were perturbing the packing. And so you can ask, well, what can you learn about the system from the velocity information? Well, first you can just look at the average velocity of the probe. If we have a fixed force on the probe, and then we just keep increasing the density of the system more and more, the average velocity with which the probe travels decreases basically linearly until you get quite close to jamming. And as you come into jamming here, it actually winds up scaling like um, phi c minus phi over phi c uh, with an exponent of 0.5. And so this is a little bit of a mystery to us. We're not quite sure what we should interpret this exponent to mean. Uh, Steve Tidal actually suggested that it could be a dynamical critical exponent, uh, which means it's way off from what you would expect for direct for, uh, direct population, which is something like 1.7. So this is a bit of an open question. This is telling us something. We're not sure what we're learning from it. The other thing we can look at is the fluctuations of the velocity. And so if you watch the, the velocity of the probe as it's moving through the packing, if you're at low densities, it's sort of moving roughly at a constant velocity with some uh, oscillations. This is actually, it's pushing some grains in the packing, and it's able to slip free and then any faster for a little bit. And then it gets hung up behind some grains again and so forth. As you increase the, the density of the packing, it spends more and more time kind of at the slow velocity where it's pushing a bunch of grains. Because of course, the length scale is increasing, and you have more grains ahead of you. But it still will slip free and try to move it close as close as it can to the free blast. Occasionally, it'll actually completely slip free and not push anybody from home, but that's very rare. And finally, as you get quite close to jamming, now it spends almost all its time in this slow state, and it has these occasional bursts of motion. Now, this is actually looks like the characteristics of an intermittent system. And one of the things it tells you is that, in fact, it's the rare events that are most, the most important events when it comes to deciding how far the probe is going to go, because even though it spends almost all of its time going at hardly any speed, it makes all of its progress when it has one of these bursts. And you've probably experienced this in traffic, you know, you sit there, you sit there, there's so many before a mile, and you sit there again. So it was only in that little burst that you make your progress. And of course, this means that in this type of system, if you start looking at average properties, you're not learning what's most important about the system. You have to look at these intermittent properties. Question? Have you tried to measure sort of the quasi-steady state times there? You can often look at the probability distribution of the time. Yes, I will come to that. Yes. Oh. Yes. So I have that. Uh, okay, so uh, when we were doing this project, we were working with Matt Hastings, and so we had the idea to try to apply a multi-scaling analysis to these fluctuations. Now, depending on your audience, this is either called multi-scaling or multi-fractal scaling, I've learned. But I'll just call it multi-scaling, and I'll play one of them anyway. Uh, so basically, this is the idea with, with the multi-scaling analysis. What you want to see is that if you look at the fluctuations of your system, are they scaling in a simple way as you approach a, a, some critical point, uh, some phase transition? In other words, can I take all my velocity distributions and collapse them together according to some control parameter? Or if it exhibits multi-scaling, I can't do that. And somehow, if I try to collapse them, I'm going to get some feature that doesn't change in the same way with all of them. And so one way you can try to find out whether you have multi-scaling is you say, all right, well, let's, let's look at the velocity distribution function. And we say, OK, so the probability of measuring a given velocity at fixed, uh, fixed density is going to be PV, P of V times PV. So we define the qth inverse moment of the velocity. And that's just going to be M of Q. It'll be uh, P of V multiplied by V to the minus Q pi. 
And now we define a set of multifractal exponents. So we claim that m of q is going to scale like phi c minus phi raised to the power of minus tau, which is a function of q. If it's not a function of q, then we don't have multiscale. Um, so what you do is, if you have this velocity distribution, you can compute m, and then you extract tau of q by just making a fit of the moments. Was there a question? Yes? What? I mean, I, I, I believe it's multi-scaling if it's non-trivial multi-scaling if it's a non-trivial function of Q. I mean, even even if it's a simple scaling, it would be a function of Q, but would okay, be a function yes. of Q? Yes, that's right. So actually, let me now show you an example. So you're absolutely right. Okay, so what if you don't have any structures? Then obviously things are going to scale. So let's take a look at what happens to the tau of Q. Uh, if I say that my... Uh, my velocity is just some constant, uh, which is a function of the density phi. And I say that this constant scales like phi c minus phi to the minus alpha power. Then when I do the multi-scaling analysis, I say, well, uh, my inverse moment is just going to be this v naught raised to the minus q power. So that means that's going to be phi c minus phi raised to the q times alpha power. And therefore, this function tau of q is just going to be minus q times alpha. So if you plot this inverse moment versus phi c minus phi, you just get a, a single straight line for all for all densities. Um, so this would be simple scaling, as, as you're saying. There's no I mean, there's no fluctuations, so there's nothing to multi-scale. Well, it's, I guess it's not even simple scaling; it's just nothing because there's no fluctuations. Okay. Well, here's simple scaling. So now we say that the uh, probability goes like some function of v over this v naught uh, times v d over v naught. And we once again say that v naught scales as you approach the, the jamming transition with an exponent alpha. So now when you look at these moments, uh, you're going to get the following expression. We're going to multiply and divide by v naught to the minus q here. We're going to have this whole piece, which I'm just going to call g of minus q, uh, when I integrate times v naught to the minus q. So that means this once again scales like phi c minus phi to the q times alpha. So once again, tau of q is minus q to the alpha, times alpha. But this g of q will shift these uh, curves depending on where, uh, depending on, uh, depending on your value of, uh, of q here. So you'll get a series of curves which are parallel to each other. But once again, this is simple scale. So finally, let's look at what happens if we actually have this multi-scaling. So suppose we have a much more complicated probability distribution. And we picked this example because we thought that's what uh, we had in our granular system, but actually it's not. So we said, all right, suppose that the probability distribution function looks like a delta function, uh, when, which, which goes like uh, when you're, so you, you go basically at, at a fixed velocity of one uh, when you're very close to phi c minus five. And then aside from that, you go like uh, fixed velocity, which is very small, and gets smaller as you get closer to the jamming transition. So the idea was that um, part of the time you're pushing a whole lot of grains and going slowly, and as you get closer to the jamming transition, you push more grains and go ever more slowly. And part of the time you slip past and move at sort of the velocity of one, and that's not sensitive to how close you are to the jamming transition. So you have these two peaks that are moving away from each other as you get close to the jamming transition. So this PDF does not have simple scaling. Uh, for uh, for some values of for high values of q, you pick out one side of the PDF. And for low values of q, you pick out the other side of the PDF. So that means tau q is going to be the minimum of either this f of zero function multiplying our fixed high velocity, or minus two times alpha, which comes from your fixed low, low velocity piece. And so if you look at a plot of tau q versus q, it's not just a straight line; it's going to have some feature to it. So this would be a signature of multi-scale. So that was an example just to try to explain what you would get from multi-scaling. So wait, when you say, why is it, or if I just look at the second component of P, P or V, why is it this. P uh, velocity that's diverging, like near Y, C? No, no, this velocity should be going to zero. Maybe I'm going to miss the sign. Well, okay, it's, you know, the yeah, velocity I, might be a plus sign. Okay. Yeah, I, okay, it should, this, should, this is supposed to be going to zero, so there might be a sign missing here. Okay, so this is, I mean, this is our multi-scaling analysis, but this is what is important. This is what we got when we measured tau of q, and here we divided it by 3. 
versus Q. And you see it has non-trivial structure. So this is an indication, yes, in fact, we have some kind of multi-scaling. Our, our velocity uh, distribution functions are not scaling in a simple way as we approach the damping transition. Uh, so a question that you always get is, all right, so what do they look like? Well, we've now measured that. So uh, let's take a look at how they look. So here's the, velocity, the raw velocity signal of a probe particle at a very low density, taken over a long time. We made a large packing to do this. So this is a density of only 0.32. So what you see is that most of the time, the particle is just moving through. And then occasionally hit essentially one particle. And then push it out of the way, move through it, and hit one particle again, and proceed through the system. Occasionally it might hit two particles. But really it's, it's or in here it's kind of a glancing blow of one particle. So the velocity distribution in that case is basically a large peak at the free velocity of the particle with a second smaller peak when it's pushing one particle out of the way. And then a little bit of dispersion there because it's sometimes a glancing blow. But okay, so the question, where are the units on time? Uh, the units, well these are so simulations. The previous slide, yeah, yeah. Uh, here, yeah, so these are just simulation steps. I mean, we're not trying to turn this into real, real time in this. This is just, you know, we have to integrate forward in time. Okay, so here you see the shape is these, these two delta functions, essentially, which is not that dissimilar to what we thought the distribution would look like at high velocities originally, but it actually looks this way at the, at the low density system. <coughs> so now as we approach jamming, this is uh, similar to what I showed you before, but in higher detail, at 5.807, now the probe particle has a much lower average velocity. And now the rare events, you know, it's kind of upside down from the other uh, plot because now it'll occasionally slip out of the pack and, and move more freely, and then we'll pick up uh, grains again. So if we look at the distribution here, we get an exponential tail of our distribution. Um, so the velocity, um, which, which it would kind of makes some sense as you're uh, trying to push the packing out of the way. Finally, as we get very close to jamming, you can kind of by eye see that there's going to be a difference in our distribution because now we have very low velocity with these huge spikes. In it. And what we see, if we plot that on a log linear scale, it's no longer exponential. <coughs> might have, this isn't that big of a change in density. The previous one was like 0 0.80. This is now 0 0.84. Um, in this case, our jamming density is 0.844. And uh, so it's no longer exponential. Now it's actually a power law. Um, so here's a log log plot, and we're finding a power law tail of velocity distribution. So that's an indication that we're getting these. Um, rare events of the large velocity spikes where it's able to break through from the pack. Okay, so what have we learned up to this point? Well, there does appear to be a diverging length scale as a jamming transition is approached. But it's not clear that it's really consistent with an obvious known phase transition. We, there was some thought that it might be the directed percolation, but it's no longer clear if it really is directed percolation or not. The velocity becomes strongly intermittent near jamming. And we get uh, multi-scaling of the velocity fluctuation, going from bimodal to an exponential tail to a power law tail when you're very close to the jamming transition. So the fact that you have these multiple velocity regimes suggests that maybe there, there really are multiple regimes. And maybe we need to take a closer look at how the German grain displaces the background media. I showed you a movie, but let's look at the statics in a little bit more detail. So now I draw uh, the grains as just open circles, and this is so that you can see the displacement a little better. And I draw paths of where the grains have moved as the driven grain goes through the packing. So here's the driven grain. This is extremely low density, 0.13. And in this case, as the grain goes through, uh, you just see it simply linearly displaces particles out of its way. You wouldn't expect anything else. Uh, and similarly, here's a somewhat higher density, 0.323. Once again, as you push this grain through, it just literally pushes everybody out of the way, and that's it. But as you get to high densities, and this is now close to jamming, so this is 0.807, this is 0.8414, hopefully you can see this, um, you no longer get only linear displacements of the grains out of the way. Um, so you start to get what looks like kind of T1 events. So yeah, if you can see this, you're starting to get some circulation of the grains that are getting pushed out of the way. So that means we're, they're not just linearly moving out, they're actually moving out in a circular. And uh, the T1 event is an analogy to forming kind of dislocations in a, in a crystal. Um, and these events occur 
once the displacement zone gets large enough, so it seems like if the displacement zone is small, you're kind of in a linear machine. But as it gets big, you switch over to this one here. So this suggested to us that maybe uh, the diverging length scale is not fitting to the dumb model because there's not actually a single length scale. Maybe there are really two length scales. Uh, the first length scale is what happens at short lengths when you're in sort of the linear regime of displacement. And the second length scale is what happens at longer lengths when the displacements are too large for the linear regime and you start getting these sort of what you could call plastic rearrangement events of the surrounding rings. And so our, our probe blends these regimes together and actually so have the other measurements of this diverging length scale. So now you can ask, well, okay, if, if this is true, how could you separate these two length scales? What, is there a way that you could study them and try to decide where the transition between the two length scales is? Uh, so one possibility that we thought of is, well, let's change the reference frame. Uh, let's make the mobile grains and drive all the rest of the grains past them. Um, so we decided to try this. The other alternative would be to drag multiple grains and try to see, you know, depending on how far space they are, if you can pick up the existence of of these different length scales. It's similar to micro rheological experiments that people are trying these days in coil systems. Uh, but experimentally, that's going to be tough. It's already been hard for experimentalists to drag one grain to a packing. So we thought, well, why not paste some of the grains down and just push everybody past? And of course, if I have just one grain, uh, I can just change reference frame and we're back to the same system as before. But as we start to have multiple grains, uh, now maybe we can get some new information. So I'll show you the same slide again, but what we've really done is uh, to the equations of motion of our grains, uh, we've, we've said certain grains simply don't get updated in time. So although we calculate the force that they exert on the other grains, we never update their position. And so that gives us these fixed grains, and they're absolutely fixed. Uh, this works better than trying to put them in a parabolic paint trap or something, because then they could get out. So these grains really can't move at all. And this is kind of an image of the sorts of flow. So remember, we're now driving everybody except for the fixed grains. And so this is looking more like a velocity force measurement. Uh, and what we see is highly heterogeneous, heterogeneous flows. So here you can see that this grain is pinned. These grains aren't drawn to the true size. And uh, other grains have had to go around the outside because it's, it's just a barrier. And so you can see these are the pin grains. And they, the moving grains have actually been kind of forced into some channels. And these guys. Uh, many of them are not actually pinned, but they're stuck. So they can't get past because there's enough pin grains to block them. So this is starting in the plugging transition question. Those, uh, those uh, nude circles around the pinned one, is that because you're just giving, making lines for the centers of the moving problem? Yeah. And, yeah. So, and also these grains aren't quite drawn to true scale. So they're, they're, they're drawn a little smaller than they really are because otherwise you can't see the trail. Um, so what's happening is that this is just um, that's a hard the, yeah. Hard so this second hard. grain can only come so close, yeah. and so that's following the center of it as okay. close as it can possibly pass. Okay. Yeah. Why why isn't that just a new problem now with the equation? Well, <laughs> okay. So that's the question. Let me let me okay. get to that. Yes, that's actually an important question. Um, and in fact, we were originally sort of thinking this was a new problem. In fact, we were thinking, well, let's uh, let's see. Let me go to the yeah, we were originally saying, well, uh, you know, we thought we kind of understood this axis, which we're no longer sure we do. And we thought, well, it would be interesting, let's add a new axis, which is pitch the sword. Uh, so now you come out along another axis, you say, well, you still have a jamming transition on that axis. What does it do to the jamming transition? Um, but now we're thinking maybe we can get some more information out of this. So the measurement that we make in this case is a little bit different. Um, we can look at the velocity of all the particles, of all the grains, as a function of our driving force, and if it's in the unjammed or in our case unclogged state, so if we if we pin down 20 of the grains at a density of 0.82, when there's about 2,500 grains in the system, uh, then the velocity force curve is just linear. If we pin down 70 of them, it's still linear but with a reduced slope. So that means that the pin grains are doing something. They're interfering with the motion of the grains through them. They're actually what's happening is they're reducing the channel of motion. And uh, if we pin down 150 grains, now if they're still moving linearly, but now it's really a reduced slope. So we have a very small channel of motion. And finally, when we pin down 300 of them, that's it. We can't move anything anymore. So this would be a, uh, a jam state along this fourth axis, or clock state. 
Yes, that's right. Much fewer channels. Absolutely, yes. So there's a lot of heterogeneity associated with this. This is a very rough measurement. We have better data now of what happens to the critical jamming threshold as a function of the number of <coughs> rings. So this was, if you don't have anything rings, this is what we measured before, which is 0.844. And of course, it depresses the uh, jamming transition. You can now jam, if you have pinned down 250 degrees, you can jam at a density of more like 0.8. 0.805 or something, rather than getting all the way up to 0.84. Now, uh, what's really going on? You, you alluded to the fact that, yes, there's, there's a lot of heterogeneity. In fact, um, you can see that here. You start reducing the place that the particles are moving down to just some channels. But it's actually more heterogeneous than that. Uh, when we were doing the jamming simulations without pin particles, the average density of the system was pretty constant <coughs> as you started to get close to jamming. But when you start adding pin particles, and especially as you add more and more pin particles, you start to get extreme variations in the density. So you start to actually get, this is not enough to show, but you'll get a situation where uh, you have you know, a series of pin particles, and you've got jammed particles clogged up behind them, and you have a big open space on the other side. And so you're at, you're really at 5C, which is 0.84 here, but the density here is basically zero. Uh, so can I really say that the jamming density is reduced to 0.81 here by adding pin particles? Or am I actually saying that, well, when you reach a density of 0.81, the system is able to get, air, get areas of density 0.84 that percolate through the system, and that blocks all the motion, and then that's it. And the cost is that you make more and more void areas. Uh, so this is where we're thinking, well, perhaps we could try to look at that. If there are two length scales, maybe we could try to pick it up with this measurement. But the complication being that now actually we have another length scale, which is this density variation. One of the issues with the granular system is that it's so susceptible to density variations. Um, unlike a system like the vortices or the collides, where density fluctuations will tend to smear out with time given a chance, because the particles would like to reduce their energy by moving away, there's no such mechanism in grains. In fact, density, just, density fluctuations tend to be unstable for growth. As you learn, fortunately, in traffic, you know, if two cars get a little bit close together, then over time, more cars will get close together and they'll sort of pile up. And then you'll have this virtual phantom traffic jam, which apparently they've studied in Japan. Uh, they made a little racetrack and watched it go around. They measured its speed and everything. Uh, so these things are real, but they're they're due to um, just the enhancement of, of density fluctuations with time. They increase rather than decrease with time. So that's one of the problems in this granular system, and it may make it more difficult to try to compare it to these phase transitions, um, things like direct interpolation. Okay, so that's clogging, and I figured you would forgive me if I came in a little short on this one. Uh, well, Okay, well, there's, hey, that must be time. Uh, <laughs> so I just, it's, I guess it's not only Monday. Yeah. But, um, yeah, you <laughs> so, so what this is supposed to say is that what we've done is simulated a two-dimensional disordered system of disks and drag one particle through. And our idea was that we wanted to probe whether there was a diverging length scale or not. So we do see what looks like a diverging length scale. The number of moving ranges diverging is a power law. And so it suggests that <coughs> the jamming transition does look kind of like a second order phase transition, but we're not quite sure what kind. It sort of looked like direct percolation, but maybe not. Um, the velocity, we also get information about velocity from our local probe, and those fluctuations increase. Uh, the system becomes very intermittent as you get closer to the jamming transition, so sorts of events are very important. Uh, but also, um, density fluctuations become very important as you get close to the jamming. Um, so it, it can become very spatially heterogeneous as well as temporally heterogeneous in the course of the tour related. Uh, we speculate that there might actually be two length scales rather than just one length scale, and that may be giving people problems with the exponents. And we've also proposed a uh, new axis for the jamming phase diagram, which we understand probably less than we understand the first axis, but now we have, uh, oh, there we go, okay. Uh, so just in time for the end of it. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, more questions? Yes. Yeah. 
So you can try to look at velocity correlation lengths and things like that. No, no, you, or, you, you are doing your response function. Uh huh. So your particles don't have dynamics, right? Right. So there's a paper in PNAS earlier this year which actually measures the four point density function. That's a paper, four point uh, density correlation function. Uh -huh. And they will find dynamics of growing length scale. In, in a granular system? No, in an MD, finally, uh, finally. Yeah, well, so is it one of these things where they find like a, a uh, let's see, I don't know, it's like a uh, dipolar excitation of the background, or? No, no, it's a simple bi binary liquid, granular zone, uh -huh. uh -huh. and, and they measure the four point density density correlation function. Okay. And, and they do find evidence of landscapes going there. Okay, yeah, and they're increasing the density of the building. Okay. This is 3D or this is 2D? 3D. Right, yeah, I haven't seen it. So. Yeah, so that's another possibility. We've got a new student working on this now, so we're trying, now that we have this two length scale idea, we're trying to think of ways to, to probe it. So. Others? Yes, let's see. Yeah, you first. I'm curious about how you do the pinning exactly. Oh, as I said, in this case, we, we constrain the dynamics of the particle. So all we do is in the, in the simulation at the point where you update the position of the particle, we just leave those out. Oh. So that means that their position is never updated. So that, you know, no matter what force acts on them, they can't move. Yeah, sorry, that's um, what I meant. How do you decide initially? Oh, how do we pick them? We pick them randomly. So, yeah. do you, so do you form your packing? Do you form your yeah, we do the pack, so the yeah, we have or? to do the packing without mm -hmm. the pinning because I don't know how to do it with the pinning. And uh, then we pin some of them down. So you have all of your grains in place, and then you can... Then we can some down, yeah. Yes? Uh, so this is a sort of stupid question, but um, some of the language you've been using is a little bit reminiscent of, like, the self-organized criticality sort of thing. Ah, things. <laughs> yes. So um, I was sort of wondering, uh, like, like, well, one question, one question is about the one over f noise, and the other question would be, uh, so would you really expect that sort of thing if you don't have this really well-defined um, steady state? I mean, you're talking about moving these particles and starting moving, and then they, they sort of, uh, and then they, then they can't move anymore. So, uh, you mean in the jam state? Yeah, or, yeah. Let's see. So, what, do you, is your question about SOC, or you just wanted to point out that there are SOC? I mean, you know that SOC was kind of developed in a granular context by Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I have worked on it in the past, along with everybody else who was doing physics in the 90s. <laughs> um, you know, and we, we haven't, I mean, we didn't get such good results in the 90s, so we didn't try to do any SOC measurement here. But you would usually be looking at a sand pile, try to get it in a stationary state yeah. and look at the fluctuations. Um, let me see. So your question was about the the, the fact that we have a transient before the yeah. thing completely jams. Yes. Or yeah, we didn't really. S I mean, we see it in the simulations, but we didn't study it carefully. It actually depends a little bit from packing to packing. The, there is a fluctuation in the jamming density. You can only measure it to some accuracy because, of course, you know, you add one more particle. It's a discrete system. Um, so we don't know exactly at what density will jam for any given packing. The only way is we just run it and find out. We don't have a good algorithm for the way that we're doing the packing. Our code isn't smart enough to know that it's made a jam packing. Uh, we just find out after we start working with it. So the code doesn't really know. Yes, they were actually jammed. What else? Yes. Um, about those two lengths, kids. Do you think one of the section are critical? Yeah, so the linear one we think, and it's probably related to... So the diverging one is the other one where you get this large... Yeah, so we think that, we think that probably um, out to some length, you can linearly displace the grains. But beyond some length, they probably buffer. Uh -huh. And uh, at that point, so you, know, you can't push this forever. Right. So that's and so, just, that's so there's some important. kind of a buckling length, we think. Mm -hmm. And that's what you're... If, you're, if this diverging length scale is below that, you're getting one, you get kind of linear behavior. But once your length, so if you call this a true length scale or something, as long as it's below LB, this is the linear regime state. And I think that's where you have the, the exponential parallel distribution, or exponential velocity distribution. So you don't have an the pretty scaling machine. Yeah, it may be, so that it may be that only once lambda is above this LB, and you go nonlinear, maybe this is where you're starting to kind of enter the beginning of the jamming threshold. And that's when you get, we think that's when you get these power law distributions instead. Because now you have 
Here you can't, I mean, you get exponential because you can't ever really move that many grains out of your way. But once you can start making these reorganizations, you can make what people have called um, uh, ball bearings, where you can rotate a whole bunch of grains out of the way. And so you can have really large displacements. That gives you these huge velocity spikes in your signal. This very strong dependency. So we think that's... So the problem is that you're analyzing these pictures and data to disentangle yeah, so, I, I mean, that's a, when we were first doing this, we didn't even think about this. But as the exponents, and at first we thought things were good because everybody's exponent was coming out the same and everything was looking consistent. But then, as the exponent measurements got better, it stopped being so good. You know, things were getting worse rather than better. And so then you start to ask, well, are we even measuring the right thing? So, you know, maybe somehow we have to measure the divergence only once we get past this weight, which means we have to find this limit. And maybe we're including too much stuff in our scaling regime. And if we included the right amount, maybe this wouldn't turn out to be. Maybe uh, new will come back down to 0.76. Or maybe it'll go to some other fixed point of some other transition. So. Okay, then another one if there's no one else. I mean, was there ever a good reason aside from staring at 0.73 that this is related to the I don't well, see any, I mean, you can argue that there's kind of, you're pushing, so the way that we're doing the measurement, you can make the argument, you, we are pushing it, so we are we have a special direction, and that the force chains are maybe percolating. And actually, the force chains may scale differently than these, than, than the, uh, the velocities in, their, in the number of grains that are moving. So that was kind of the hand-waving argument. But Mostly it was just... Absorbing stuff, right? Well, yeah, so we don't really, yeah, exactly. Exactly, so it was mostly like, well, isn't directed percolation sort of 0.6? I mean, that was kind of the the logic. And uh, so therefore, we don't really have a firm leg to stand on. So that's why I'm not really married to uh, to directed percolation. It could, well, it may be not, not that, but something else, or it might be nothing, you know, not any of these, and not really a phase transition at all, something else. So. Anyone else? I actually have... So myself, so if you could try to extract time scales in different ways, one, I guess, I don't know if you tried, is to do uh, power spectrum of the of the Yes, we're doing that actually right now. Okay, yeah. another another way is what what we tried in in the in these uh, evolution experiments by trying to essentially extract a probability distribution for the times between the big spurts. <coughs> Looking at the, the intermittency explicitly, basically. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. that, uh, because your, your, probab uh, your velocity distribution isn't that wide. You get, you get like one, or, uh, one order of magnitude, mm -hmm. one decade of power law. But uh, your, so what we did there is essentially take the in our case, it was the entropy derivative. But in your case, take, take the velocity, mm -hmm. take the time series, make a cut off at some level, mm -hmm. and and then look at the intervals, and, and then look at the intervals, look at the uh, look at the distribution of the intervals during which the velocity lies below that one, and then do that with different cutoffs. Mm -hmm. You might be able to find at least the range of cutoffs where they're not such that you have no statistics or that you get into everything's about. So, so in between there, you might be able to find some something interesting in the, in the distribution of uh, waiting times mm -hmm. or between slip events or the fact, exactly. time, the waiting spent, time, time spent stuck in traffic. Exactly, <laughs> and then as you get your cut off down, where then you pick up more and more of the short mm -hmm. ones. Yeah, that's. I mean, we're, we're sort of manpower on this yeah. project, but yeah, that's a good suggestion. Anyone else? Well, then let's think. Thanks. Yeah.